But it's not even really about money, it's about energy, because money is simply this material thing that allows billions of people to crave just one thing and put their energy into the same thing. It's not the plasma TV or the house or the lifestyle or the job or the significant other or the status that we're really after because we know that we're empty. These people feel sadness and loneliness and void just like anybody else and they either want to fill that void with materialism because they think that that'll make them feel better or they want to sedate the void feeling with material possessions. So it all comes back to this feeling of having to put our dependency into an external source, something that we have absolutely no control over. What we're seeing right now is with all the competition of each other destroying each other, wars, competing for material existence, raping the planet and tearing it apart to get some pieces of it to hold in your hands and say you won the game. Every one of those moves is destructive, not just of the planet, but of human civilization. Because human civilization will thrive with cooperation and will die with competition. And if you operate from these truths, then you end up with the extinction that lies before us. You see, we all have demons, so to speak. We all have inner demons in our lives, but we expect to see devilish monsters or dark apparitions when you think of a demon, kind of like what you see in the cinema. But our demons are really the people in our everyday lives, the people that we argue with, the people that we envy or hate, uh, the ones we physically or emotionally harm in some way, shape, or form. And it's not because we envy or hate qualities in these specific people as much as we hate the fact that they remind us of ourselves. They reflect qualities about ourselves that we wish we had more of or that we wish we didn't have at all. So what do we do? We alleviate that pain, not by fixing or fighting our own demons, but by harming the people that remind us of our demons, by harming the people that remind us of the things that we don't like about ourselves. And when we become frustrated that we're not in control of our emotions because we don't really know what's affecting our emotions, we take it out on others. We take it out on absolutely anything else that can show us or act as a catalyst for our hatred and so we do the same thing to animals animals are perfect because they can't defend themselves and it's a perfect catalyst for our inner aggression our confusion our hatred just take it out on something absolutely helpless just imagine how unconscious a person has to be of his or her actions to torture or mutilate or brutalize any living thing It goes down and uh, he'll be here and we can, ouch, come on. Oh, hit you. Look at his tail. Is it coming with a kiss maybe? He's a big yeah, guy. I mean, that's, um, that's a real. Think of the lack of compassion you must have towards life in general to be able to feel no semblance of sympathy towards entire populations, let alone just individuals or individual animals, entire populations of species that are bred specifically for the purpose of commodity. But I'll tell you what's even more dangerous is not so much the people carrying out this cruelty, because that's already been established. That form of hatred and cruelty has already been established and it's already known. What I'm really worried about is the people who are against inhumanity, the people who are against animal cruelty and feel self-righteous enough to think that it's justified to inflict harm or even wish harm on these people. Because those are the people who take unconscious cruel behavior to a whole new level of conscious cruel behavior that's perfectly acceptable in their minds because they feel that it's their job to bring other people to justice, like they're an authority figure of some sort. Those are the people who will have a much harder time figuring out why they harbor so much inner hatred and resentment. They don't seem to realize that it's just another form of the same exact hatred. So to keep from facing 
our inner demons consistently, what do we do? When we begin to realize, hey, wait a minute, maybe it's not all right to inflict harm on any other living thing, then the ego has to come up with a more esoteric form of cruelty to trick us into displaying the same form of self-hatred, the same indignant attitude, but just in another way and towards another group of people. But the emptiness will always find a way back in and people will always start to feel restless again no matter how many times they transfer blame to yet another person or yet another group. We need chaos in our lives. We crave destruction. We beg for catastrophe. Because if we don't have these things to act as a form of exorcism or a catalyst for us, we start to notice these things in ourselves and that's what we don't want. You see, we can deal with wars. We can deal with terrorism, we can deal with stock market collapse and economic collapse, we can deal with these things, but once we start to notice this chaos within ourselves, that's what we're really afraid of. We'll take a million September 11ths over one moment of true insight towards our self-hate. And you know, the most interesting part of all of this is we encounter things every day, every single day that we either accept with open arms or that we reject violently. The interesting part is not really what we're accepting or rejecting as much as what it is inside us that makes us feel compelled to a certain thing or repelled from a certain thing. There's this fundamental dual behavior of muscular strength or weakness attraction or repulsion. And what's interesting about this is when you realize that consciousness, awareness, that intangible essence that animates all matter into what we see around us as life, that is where you will find the origin of this dual behavior. It's been explained as the inhalation and exhalation of Brahma, the contraction and the expansion of Araman and Lucifer in an anthroposophical setting the active and the passive qualities in electricity, the masculine and feminine qualities, yin and yang, existence and nothingness. These are all ways to explain the same behavioral process that begins with awareness, it begins with consciousness. And if you get rid of all the images and concepts in our minds of these sayings in your head and just try to feel the difference between the two polarities, you'll begin to notice that all of the different scenarios and possibilities that are playing out in the world all spawn from this common origin. You'll have a million people telling you why the Bible is supposedly the Word of God and that you should follow it word for word. And then you'll have another million claiming that it's a form of mind control and not to believe any of it. Everybody will tell you to beware of this or watch out for that. This is good information. This is bad information. And I just have to wonder what makes anyone an authority figure enough to say that something is true or false? And why are you denying or accepting anything based on the suggestion of another person? Why aren't you making that decision for yourself? Information is information. There's no such thing as good or bad information. It's all what you do with it. I say let everything be your Bible. Give every piece of information, every person, every event or scenario or situation an honest and open mind because then it's your responsibility to respond to it in the way that you choose. Not following the herd, not following convention, it's your responsibility. And that's the point when, no matter how many people tell you you're wrong or right, you're not dependent upon their approval. If we at least question our own actions, question our own thought process, and make a conscious decision to what we feel is right every single day, that's what I believe to be divinity. That's true shamanism, and that to me is what it really feels like to be alive.